All right, y'all turn to Ezekiel chapter 12. <clears throat> That's in the Old Testament, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 12. <clears throat> now let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started. Our Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege of being able to approach You in prayer. We recognize what it took to make this possible, and that's the death of Your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that You always remind us of this, keep it always in our minds, and never let us forget what it took for us to be able to approach You. Let us use this privilege often. Let us use it sincerely. Let us glorify and praise Your name in all things for the sake of Your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Alright, we're going to start doing, we, we did a little bit one Thursday night at Derrick's and I got a bunch of questions and some other things, so we're just going to take our time and we're going to go back and we're going to examine some things about the second coming, okay? But we're going to do it in a different light. Now, I want to read from Ezekiel 12. We're going to do just a little bit of reading from the Old Testament because I want to show y'all, uh, y'all know Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, right? Literally, nothing new ever happens. It just keeps reoccurring. Well, that same thing is going on today. Now, to give you a little bit of insight, all right, the northern ten tribes had gone off into captivity. Judah was in the land, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar had already come and put them under servitude and took some back captive. Now, not many, but Daniel was among that group and went back. Jeremiah the prophet was there in Judah at that time prophesying to the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, the remnant. And there was also Ezekiel, but Ezekiel was in Babylon. So you had one prophet in the land telling the people what to expect and what was coming, and you had another in Babylon telling the captains. So both of them are prophesying. And Ezekiel writes some things, and it's almost like he's coming to the aid of Jeremiah, and he tells them. Because what was happening in Judah is this. Now imagine you're the chosen people, they would say, right? You dwell in this fenced city with the wall and you, you just think, okay, we're God's chosen people. Nothing can touch us and that sort of thing. We hear that kind of thing today, don't we? And when Nebuchadnezzar came and put them under captivity, he took some of them off. He took the vessels of the temple too, took their treasures off. And there began to be some men that started to make comments. See, Jeremiah prophesied and said, basically, pack your bags, you're all going to Babylon. The man's coming back and the whole town, this is of God, the whole nation is going off into captivity. But guess what some men begin to slowly say? Not so. No, not so. Jeremiah's got it wrong. And they begin to prophesy and they're false prophets. And they begin to preach what the Bible says, peace and safety. In other words, they begin to tell Israel that you are not appointed unto that. You don't have to worry about that. Actually, and it just kept growing more and more until finally, you know, it starts out real vague. You know how they start real vague? Well, it seems. And, you know, and then the longer it goes, men become more bold and more bold until they come out and actually make predictions. And we see it today, don't we? It's the same thing. Well, we're going to read from Ezekiel what Ezekiel says about that. And we're going to read a little bit from Jeremiah just to set up what we're going to talk about. Now, in Ezekiel 12, verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord also came unto me, saying, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are a rebellious house. Therefore, thou son of man, prepare thee stuff for removing. In other words, pack your bags, Right? And remove by day in their sight, now shall remove from thy place to another place in their sight. It may well be they will consider that though they be a rebellious house. In other words, God's given Ezekiel a vision where he's going to pack up. Remember how the hobo would put the stick on this thing because he was going off? Of, he's going to kind of do that sort of thing in front of them to symbolize that they're gonna, something's going to happen. Now he says, uh, verse 4. Then shalt thou bring forth thy stuff by day in their sight, as stuff for removing. Now shalt go forth at evening in their sight, as they that go forth into captivity. Dig thou through the wall in their sight, and carry out thereby. Now it's important to remember this. He's not telling him to literally go do this physically in the sight of all those people in Babylon. They're already in captivity. Ezekiel is having visions, and in his visions he sees these things, and God tells him to do these things in his vision, and then he writes about them. This letter gets sent back to Judah, so they get this. He, he's, this is the, the, the play he's acting out. Verse 6, 
In their sight shalt thou bear it upon thy shoulders, and carry it forth in the twilight. Thou shalt cover thy face, that they see not the ground. For I have uh, set thee for a sign unto the house of Israel. And as I did so, I was commanded. I brought forth my stuff by day, and stuff for captivity. And in the evening I dig through the wall with my hand. I brought it forth in the twilight, and I bear it upon my shoulder in their sight. And in the morning came the word of the Lord unto me, saying, Son of man. Hath not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said unto thee, What doest thou? Say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, This burden concerneth the prince in Jerusalem, and all the house of Israel that are among them. Now the prince is the king. At this time it's Zedekiah. Okay, Zedekiah is the king, and he's been appointed by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, basically what's happening is, he's, he's prophesying what's going to happen to the king in Judah. You know what the king winds up doing? basically digs a hole through the wall, escapes at night, and runs out. Hey, they're prophesying back home he's going to rule and reign and everything's going to be put back in right order. No, he sneaks out in the middle of the night, Zedekiah, and Nebuchadnezzar's men catch him. And they take him back to Babylon, just like the Lord said. Now, he just said he's not going to see the land. Why didn't Zedekiah see the land of Babylon? Because his eyes were put out. That's right. They got him back there. And the last thing Nebuchadnezzar did is he killed his sons right before his face and then plucked out his eyes. The very last thing the man ever saw was that, right? So this is the prophecy, but he says, uh, let's see, uh, verse 12. The prince that is among them shall bear upon his shoulder in the twilight and shall go forth. They shall dig through the wall to carry out their body, shall cover his face, that he see not the ground with his eyes. My net also will I spread upon him, he shall be taken in my snare, and I'll bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. I will scatter toward every wind all them that are about to help him, and all the bands, and I'll draw out the sword after them. They shall know that I am the Lord when I scatter them among the nations and disperse them in the countries. I will leave a few men of them from the sword, from the famine, the pestilence, that they may de declare all the abominations unto the heathen, whether they are come, and they shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, those prophets back there are prophesying something false, right? Uh, Ezekiel is told to straighten this mess out. Now, if we, we go on, and again, I don't want to just spend a bunch of time reading this. Y'all read it when you get a chance. Read Ezekiel 12 through 14. But look, come on down to, uh, let me find it. Look in verse uh, 22. Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel saying, the days are prolonged and every vision faileth? And, you know, in other words, well, the prophet said all this, but it's been a long time and ain't nothing happened yet. Must not be true. Remember, Peter said they come scoffers saying, well, they prophesied, but I don't see the end coming. Y'all know people say that sort of thing. He says, tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord, I will make this proverb to cease. They shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel's, but say unto them, the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. In other words, that's all fixing to come to an end. Okay, now, men are saying peace and safety in Jerusalem, and guess what's right around the corner? Destruction. Destruction. Nebuchadnezzar is about to come to town and destroy the whole bunch of them, destroy the temple and everything, and these men are prophesying, that's not for us. That's for those other people. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. It sounds mighty familiar, doesn't it? Now watch chapter 13. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Then are they prophesying anything from God? Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. You know, a fox is known for his cunning, in he? Mm -hmm. So here we've got some men that are foxy. They're out foxing the people with their mouth. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. They have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have you not seen a vain vision? Have you not spoke a lying divination? Where have you say the Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore behold I am against you, saith the Lord. Mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. 
They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel, neither shall they enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord God. You know, that's a pretty strong statement against a fellow like John Hagee, isn't it? Y'all know who John Hagee is? Yeah. John Hagee has made a, a, not only a fortune, but made a lifetime out of these prophecies, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. He doesn't say he's having a vision. He's saying he got the, the key to understanding prophecy. And me and Lexi go to this thrift store in Pensacola. They have a real good book section. So when we go in there, I go and look through the books. And I just noticed a book the other day that always makes me think of this. Four Blood Moons by John Hagee. Now, when, when was that written? Just recently. Recently. Why? What was supposed to happen recently? The Four Blood Moons. The Four Blood Moons was the end of it, folks. Look out. Here it comes, right? At the four blood moons, the Lord's going to secretly take everybody out that belongs to Him. Y'all remember all that? There's the book on the shelf. Y'all know the same people that bought that book will buy His next book. Yeah. Is He always prophesying these things? See, it sounds real good to act like you've got the key to the vision and you can take the current events and decipher them. And that's what He does. His big thing now is He's focused on Russia and Syria. And boy, He's got it all figured out, doesn't He? And he'll show you in the scriptures and it all sounds real good. The problem is, what did he say 20 years ago? He had the same different, you know, he's just, in other words, he's, what is he doing? He's fooling people. And what's his real motive? Money. Money to sell them something, right? Now, this is the same thing that was happening in Israel. They were telling people, hey, we, we've got the key to all of this. Now, it says verse uh, 10. Because, even because they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. You know, literally, we could probably just spend all day in this chapter talking about it, because there's so much there, but I want to want to get through it. But imagine a man building a wall, and then the one daubing it with untempered mortar, it's literally like whitewashing it. You ever had somebody whitewash you? What's that mean? They, they, it means no, no real paint is involved. That's it, right. It flakes off eventually. That's right. It just gives it a nice white appearance for a minute. Imagine a man building. Y'all know what it means to build a straw man? To set up a false opponent in Tara? These people have erected a false prophecy. He said, and these prophets are out there whitewashing it. They're steadily adding something to the exterior to make it look good because the wall keeps, keeps wanting to fall down because it's not a real wall. So every day they're adding a little change to it or something. Well, y'all know in the 1800s, early 1800s, a lady claimed she saw a vision. And from that came a, another man and some charismatic junk. And then came another man that wanted to be no, noted as a... Anyway, and it just kept going. And every day they're adding to this, this wall, whitewashing it. Now what happens to a wall that has no strength, even if you whitewash it? Well, it comes crumbling down. So he says here in verse 11, Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and he sh a great hailstone shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rent it. He he's going on talking about all these things that he's going to do in his anger. He says, verse 14, So will I break down the wall that you have daubed with untempered mortar, and bring it to the ground, so the foundation thereof shall be discovered, and it shall fall, and you shall be consumed in the midst thereof. You shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath upon the wall, and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither they that daubed it, to wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord. What about these people that tell you that the church has nothing but peace to look forward to every day? What does the Bible say? Tribulation and anguish and suffering, isn't it? Folks, what happened to the saints in the first century? They suffered. A lot of them got killed and suffered. What happened to them in the second century? The same. What's happened to them ever since? You know, I have a friend that lives in the, over in the Netherlands. And she told me about the, the what most of the church believes for the end time thing. And look, I believe this too. I was showed it and it sounded good. And I'm glad I went down that dog trail now because you learned from it. She said, only in America could you get people to believe that the church was to look forward to peace and safety. Now, why would she say that? 
Because it don't say it in the scriptures. It, it doesn't say it in the scriptures. And what if the church experience in every other country? Tribulation and persecution right. and anguish, right? right? We haven't yet. That's we haven't right. yet. That's right. Well, she's talked to. Yeah. yeah. Now y'all think about that. Miss Jackie said we haven't yet. Okay. We haven't yet experienced physical stuff. And I'm, hey, if, we, if the country remains along, it's coming. Yeah. But whether it comes or not, you and I are experiencing something far more sinister than a physical attack. We live in the worst spiritual attack that's ever existed. Has there ever been a more worldly system to attract believers? Has there ever been more lies and false teachings to cipher through? And no, we, we live in the midst of tribulation. But anyway, what she's saying is only in America could men prophesy, like John Hagee, peace and safety to you, woe unto them, right? Right? <clears throat> in, the, in the case of Jerusalem, isn't that exactly what they're getting said? He, look, one group had been taken off into captivity, and these men say, well, see there? They're not really of us. See, they're, they're the false ones. God took care of them, not us. We're going to dwell right here in safety. And they go so far as to say, one of them even stands up, I'll read it to you in a minute, and said, that's it. The Lord just spoke to me two years to the day and everything's coming home and we're going to be reestablished. Now that's getting pretty bold, isn't it? That ain't near as bold as the Four Blood Moon book, is it? I, I, there, somebody had sent me videos a while back from a fellow in Milton somewhere and he was teaching and he was presenting the cross and hey he, he, he presented the gospel and I'm thankful for that but then he started talking about these signs in the heavens and he had it all figured out that people had last September it was supposed to happen that the, the constellations were all aligned right that it was Revelation chapter 12 about to take place this man's from Milton he's got a big following and he basically said y'all look out now September that's pretty bold isn't it How's he look now? He's gonna move today. Yeah, he's gonna have to move his day. He's got he's got what do they say, pie on his face, right? Okay, well these people are doing the same thing. Now watch, let's just read a little bit more of this. He says, verse uh, 17. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people. Here we got some women involved, which prophesy out of their own heart and prophesy thou against them. Have y'all ever noticed how often women are involved in this sort of thing at its inception? Why does it seem like women are typically, in a, I'm not against women now, but why does it seem like so many times in the Bible, women are used at the very inception of a thing like this? They're more gullible. They're more gullible. They're the weaker vessel. Doesn't mean y'all are dumb. It doesn't mean y'all are anything. It just means your mind has a different way of thinking. I, look, I can personally tell y'all a woman I know can do 15 things at one time. She can. Man can't. No. Y'all know how we are. We get zoned in on something. We can't even hear nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. we, we're like that. That's how we are. Well, look down through the Scriptures. How has Satan used uh, ladies? and he's, he's used them as the spark, a germ for something, hasn't he? Well, that's how this whole thing that the world believes today started with a little Scottish girl over there in 1830, roughly, 1820-something. But anyway, he says in verse 18 to these women, Say, thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all the armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Now this is talking about something they did. You know, when they reclined at a table to eat, they didn't sit. They, they laid. And what he's talking about, when I read this verse, I always think of, y'all. anybody watch I Dream of Genie? Remember when the inside of Genie's bottle? Y'all remember what it looked like? It was pillows everywhere, wasn't it? Total comfort, relaxing. This is some custom they had where they would sew pads into there to be comfortable, right? In other words, woe unto them women that are promoting comfort and luxury. Does that sound familiar? Now he says, Will you hunt the souls of my people? Will you save the souls alive that come unto you? And will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread? You know, it'd be one thing for them to tell these lies for millions of dollars, but they'll do it for a couple bucks. How about Hagee's doing it for a, a 1099 book? That's, I mean, seriously, that's what's going on. Now he says, to slay souls that should not die, to save souls alive that should not live, by your lying to my people, you hear your lies. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold... I'm against your pillows, 
Wherewith you shall hunt the souls and make them fly. I will tear them from your arms and let the souls go. The souls that you hunt to make them fly. Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand. And they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. You shall know that I am the Lord. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Therefore you shall see no more vanity, nor divine uh, divinations, for I will deliver my people out of your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now I take a lot of comfort in those last few verses. Did God's people at Jerusalem, was there still some of God's people there? Did they get taken in by these false stories? Did God ultimately deliver them from them? Well, I take a lot of comfort in that when I look at the church today. There's a lot of, most people believe a certain scenario. Look, I did too. And again, I taught it. And Hey, I'm thankful for it. There's no harm done in a thing when me and you foul it up if we learn from it. The harm is when you don't learn and keep doing it, right? So what I've done is I've put this up on the board. I just put up here, Job, Isaiah, Daniel, Jesus, Paul, Peter, and John. And I put some things over here that said about the second coming of the Lord. About the, the last things that are going to happen. The judgment. All the things associated with the end time. The wrath of God. All those things. I've just listed some. This is by no means complete. But I've just listed some up here. Okay. Now what we're going to do. We're going to take our time. And we're going to go through these passages. And we're just going to put an X for what they see here related to the second coming. Then we're going to stand back and we're going to see if what Job, Isaiah, and Daniel said is completely different from what Jesus said. Or if it's the same. Then we're going to compare it to what Peter and John said and see if it's different or it's the same. And last but not least, we're going to see what Paul said. And I'll go ahead and tell you all before we end, we're going to wind up with a bunch of X where everybody sees the same thing. Now, before you start typing an email, I want you all to just look. Be, be patient with us. We're just going to read the scriptures. That's all we're going to do. But I want you, again, before you type this email and send it to me, if your argument against what we're going to see is you can't say this because and you don't have flat scripture to say otherwise, if you're going to email me some rule of thumb well, you can't mix this with that. Or if you're going to email me some um, hypothesis or some guideline that some man says, ask yourself, why can't I just present flat scripture to, to deny this? And that, I mean, that'd be the thing to do, wouldn't it? So just think about that. Look, I know it's going to go against a lot of people's ideas and they're going to say, no, that can't be because such and such and such and such. But just let's see what the scripture says, okay? Now, before we uh, go any further, I want to read a little bit in Jeremiah. Y'all go to Jeremiah 23. Because remember, Jeremiah is dealing with the same thing. The only difference is, Jeremiah is actually in the city when it's being said. Now, what did the people do to Jeremiah? Put him in a pit. They put, put him in a, in a well. pit. Folks, they buried him up to his neck and then threw him in a dungeon, didn't they? Now, y'all think about why they did that. He was telling them something they didn't want to hear. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. He was saying something that they didn't want to hear. He was going against what they had been told, and what they had been told was a lot more palatable, wasn't it? Who wants to hear, hey, you fixing to go into slavery? They didn't want to hear that, did they? Mm -hmm. So along comes some man and says, calm down. Jeremiah's lost his mind. He's crazy. Quit listening to Jeremiah. You come over here and listen to me. You unsubscribe from Jeremiah and you subscribe to my channel and I'll write. That's the same thing. Hey, what we're talking about here is telling people what they want to hear. Now, what did Paul say the church was going to end up like? People with itching ears, right? Okay, now, in Jeremiah 23, I just want to read y'all some of this. It's the same group of people. He says... Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Now remember what they're feeding them. Words. He says, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries, whether I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. Now, don't make that political Israel. 
Okay? Did Jesus Christ tell the apostles that they were a fold? You know what He said at that same time? Other sheep I have that are not of this fold. Them also will I bring in. He says, verse 4, I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. In other words, God said, I'm going to make sure that my people come out of this and I'm going to give them somebody to, to teach them, you know, to tell them the truth, He says. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now, y'all think about the fear of thinking you might have to go through something uh, painful or hurtful or scary. There can be fear associated with that. What is greater to the glory of God? That God would keep Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego from going into that furnace? Or that God could let them go into the furnace and keep them from harm? Y'all see what's greater to God's glory? Hey, I would whole rather know that I've got a God that not can keep me from that man that might could get me. I've got a God that can keep me from anything He puts me in. In other words, could anybody hurt them three boys? How about Daniel? They set up a lie and twisted it and got him, threw him in the lion's den, didn't they? You know a lion's den. I, somebody sent me, I think Diane sent me a picture one time and it always stuck in my mind. Daniel was sitting there with his back to the lions, praying to God, smiling, looking up at God, talking with the Lord. And those lions are sitting behind him, look like they had spit their dentures out. They're just sitting behind, you know what I mean? What could those lions do? Nothing. Now why couldn't the lions do anything? God controlled them. Because God created the lions and controls them too. What about all these armies in the world? And these folks, they ain't doing anything that God ain't allowing when God got ready to destroy Jerusalem, did He let it get destroyed before He was ready? When He got ready, did the Romans come and destroy it? You know what God called the Roman army? My army. What did He call Nebuchadnezzar? My servant. My rod. We serve a God that controls all things. Now Jeremiah goes on. He says, verse 5, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch. There's Christ. A king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. This is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now, is that something that's just going to happen at the second coming? Or has Jesus Christ been reigning since his death? He's been reigning since his death, hasn't he? He says, uh, verse uh, 7, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country, from all countries where they have driven them, and they shall dwell in their own way. In other words, the day is coming when the people are going to say, Hey, that thing he did with Israel coming out of Egypt was incredible, but it don't compare to what he's done now. Now, did He deliver them from the bondage of Egypt? But what did He deliver us from at the cross? The bondage of sin. Which one's greater? Bondage of sin is far stronger than the Egyptian army, isn't it? So He's talking about these things. And again, He goes on, He says, verse uh, 10. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing, the land morph. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. The course is evil and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their way shall be unto them slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein. I will bring evil upon them even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery, walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of uh, uh, them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood, and make them drink the water of gall. For the, uh, from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness, go forth into all the land. Now y'all remember that wormwood comes up again in the Revelation, doesn't it? Folks, that's not some kind of a missile. It's not something from outer space. It's bitterness introduced into the people of God through words. He says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Verse 21. 
I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken unto them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from the evil way and from the evil of their doings. Verse 25. I have heard what the prophets said that prophesy lie in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? They are prophets of deceit and of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man and his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? You know, you get that blood moon book. Four blood moons, right? Get that book and bring it out and start reading it. And get someone that knows and believes the scripture. And what would they do with that book? Barn. They'll beat it to pieces with the scripture, won't they? Verse 30, Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, Behold, I am against them that prophesy. And again, he's just going on with all these things. And I don't want to uh, belabor the point, but I just want to read a specific prophecy. Go to chapter 28. And just watch how it ends up. Now, I want you all to think about all this starting with one little murmur. Right? Ain't that how a rumor always starts? Mm -hmm. How does all false doctrine begin? That's exactly right, Miss Jackie. Whisper. A false prophet doesn't walk into a group of people for the first time, stand up boldly and announce, but no, he's got too much at stake. See, prophecy is a, is a distinct thing. You say something's going to happen and it's got to happen, doesn't it? So it starts with a little whisper or murmur. In this case, there's women involved, just like in what we're dealing with now. But watch 28. It came to pass the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the uh, fourth year, fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azar the prophet, which was of Gideon, spake unto me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests of all the people, saying, now this is what he says to Jeremiah. He comes right to Jeremiah and says this. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years will I bring again into this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. This thing went so far that they're now actually putting dates on it, aren't they? They're signing their name to it. Y'all see how the things just kept steadily evolved? Okay, I wanted to do that just to show y'all the same thing that we're going to deal with here. Alright? For 18 centuries... Did anybody in the church see several comings of the Lord in the future? Oh, well, actually, a lot of men thought He would come during their lifetime. They did. They thought it was imminent at any time. Uh -huh. Well, that's because the Lord said He's going to come as a thief in the night. Is it profitable for Christians to live like the Lord could come at any time? Yes, you Absolutely. You don't want to be in the wrong place when He comes. Y'all you know, think about how smart the Lord is. And, you know, I can remember being little and supposed to do something, and I know my granny could come home at any time. I'd get busy. If I knew she wasn't coming until 5.30 or 6 o'clock, I'd lay her on until 5.30, right? Y'all know what we're like. Y'all know our nature. So then, would the Lord uh, see profit in having people expect a return, even though to Him He knows there may be some distance, but to us, isn't it profitable? I mean, think if this stuff is not profitable, then all of this is only good for one generation in the future. And that's what a lot of people say about Revelation. It's just for one generation in the future. John said things are about appalling. They're, they're near to come. Okay, anyway. All of a sudden, again, it starts with a woman. She claims she saw a vision. And in her vision, it was real vague, but it was a secret wisping, wisping away. And y'all know what I'm talking about. And she told it to a man who had a, a congregation in Scotland, and he himself was involved in spiritism and, and charismatic. It was the roots of the charismatic thing, and all these 
so-called uh, visions were going on and people speaking in foreign languages, including this little girl speaking in unknown gibberish. And, and from there, he started teaching it, wrote on it. The first time you ever find anything written about it, it's in the writings of that little group. They had a newsletter. And some guy from another sect looked over there and saw this. Now, he saw it. It's kind of like uh, Chris was telling me the other day about the guy that started McDonald's. What's his name? Uh, Croc? Croc. That Croc. Croc didn't really come up with the idea for McDonald's. Now, I never knew that. Where'd Croc get it from? The McDonald's brothers. He's, he found these McDonald brothers had it and he saw a good thing. In other words, they didn't have the right promotion. They didn't have the right... He knew he could take that thing and put it right. Well, that's what this man did. And his name's Darby and it went and boom, it took off and it's gone. Now, I just wanted to cover all of that. And I know that's a lot of, lot of stuff to get to what we really want to do. Now, we're going to start now by going and looking at exactly what the Scriptures say about the day of the Lord. Now, I've put up here the day of the Lord, the day of Christ. I used to believe that there was a difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. There's not. Folks, isn't Christ the Lord? How about it's called the day of God? Isn't Christ God? See, to make these days different, and that's where all these differences and separations come in. And what we wind up being, in my own studies, I can tell you, I've been like a man that has taken a piece of something, I don't care what it is, a clock or something, completely apart, laid all the gears and spread them all out, and there it is, it won't work, but all the pieces are before you, right? Then what do you do? You begin putting it back together. As you slowly put it back together, when you finally get it back to where it works, guess what? It was a profitable exercise, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Do you now know how it works? Mm -hmm. he, you know, uh, Wayne, you remember the first time you tore down an engine? Mm -hmm. I, I had an eye. My uncle told me how an engine works. And I, in my mind, thought I understood. But no, when you take it all apart and then you put it back together... And you, you balance it, you, you blueprint it, and then you time it, and you, get, you understand now what's going on in there, don't you? Okay, let's just start by going to uh, Isaiah. No, let's go to Job first. We'll do Job, then we'll take a break. Job 14. Now look, I put Job first because... They say, and y'all know how that is, but they say Job is the oldest book, the oldest writings. Personally, I believe that. I, and I wouldn't argue, it ain't worth arguing over, it doesn't matter. We know it's official, Christ quoted. But if you look at the age that Job lived to, Job lived to be really old, didn't he? Job didn't die at 100 years old. If you look at the age at which he died and look after the flood, how it started going backwards, and you look, he probably lived before Moses a good deal. But anyway, probably around the time of Abraham. But it's one of the oldest. So we're going to just see what he has to say first. Now in Job 14, that's where we're going to start. <clears throat> Alright, verse 10. It says, But man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? You know, that's like saying we die and go right back to the dirt, right? Mm -hmm. And where's he at? As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and dryeth up, so man lieth down and riseth not, till or until the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So when did Job expect resurrection? Now first off, I've got resurrection of the dead, right? Is Job talking about the resurrection of the dead? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And when did he say it would happen? Notice he says, till the heavens be no more. So that if we come down here, I've got somewhere up here, heaven and earth pass, right? New heaven and new earth. Does Job say that the resurrection will be after the heavens are no more? Mm -hmm. I can put an X there. Okay, now he says, They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep, Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. So what else does Job say is going to happen? Wrath. Wrath. I'm going to put an X right here. <coughs> wrath poured out. Okay. 
Now he says, verse 14, If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Now by resurrection, I also put change, right? Did Job expect to be resurrected the same or changed? Changed. changed? So when Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. Was being changed new information? But what about people being changed without dying? That was something mysterious, wasn't it? Okay. Now he says, verse 15, Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Alright, hold on. How about trumpet, shout, voice? Did he say there's going to be a call? Okay. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou will have a desire to the work of thine hands. In other words, the Lord has got all this set up, and he's going to do it, isn't he? So here's what Job says uh, based on his expectation at the time that he wrote. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we want to again see. We're going to take a break, but we want to see this. As we unfold this, are we seeing two different pictures? Or are we seeing a steady progression of information? Progression. It's a progression. Does each one add more information to the... Yeah. And by the time we get over here to John the Revelator, as Johnny Cash calls him, by the time we get over here, we got a good picture, don't we? Okay, let's take a break and then we'll go back to it.